Welcome to A Little Too Quiet, the Ferndale Library podcast, brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library. Thanks for clicking play on a podcast about a library. I'm here inside the Ferndale Area District Library. My name is Jeff Milo with producer Kelly Bennett, one mile north of Detroit, Michigan. We're talking to a Detroit area author today whose name is Michael Zadorian. He has a new book coming out in a few months called The Narcissism of Small Differences. We're going to talk about that as well as his previous work like The Leisure Seeker. So thanks for tuning in. All right. Thanks for tuning into this podcast. I'm saying tuning, but this is clearly streaming. You're not tuning into this on your radio. However, we're glad you're listening. This is the third episode of A Little Too Quiet, and this podcast was started to sort of demonstrate the ways in which libraries have changed and the ways in which libraries are a little louder than they used to be. But part of our programming is bringing you local authors like Michael Zadorian. Zadorian is a award-winning author, winner of the Michigan Notable Book Award, uh, as well as a Kresge Fellow. His work has appeared in several esteemed literary magazines, and he has several books out, including Second Hand, The Lost Tiki Palaces of Detroit, Beautiful Music, and another book, The Leisure Seeker, which was actually turned into a major motion picture. If you're not a reader out there, maybe it passed through your radar because it starred Helen Mirren and Donald Sutherland. But we're here to talk about all of those books, including his new one, which is coming out soon, called The Narcissism of Small Differences. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hi, Jeff. How you doing? I'm good. The first thing you can do on this podcast is help me pronounce the name of your publishing house who's putting out this book. Is it Akashic? You know, I think they answer to, to anything. I tend to, to uh, call them uh, Akashic, Akashic in my, in my uh, you know, Midwestern nasally way. But uh, <laughs> they definitely will answer to Akashic. Akashic? I've heard them. I've heard them use it both ways, but actually, I think they generally go with it, uh, Akashic. I've almost gone with Akashic. Well, like, that's a choice. All right. Well, <laughs> great. You can find Akashic. They are Brooklyn-based publishing house putting out your new book. How does it feel to have a new book coming out? It feels kind of great, actually. I have had in the past. I have had long periods of time in between in between books. So this is the first time I will have a, a measly two years in between books because I had nine years between my first and second novel and nine years between my second and third. It wasn't exactly my, my big uh, uh, literary career plan uh, to, to like lop out a book every uh, 10 years or so, but that's sort of the way it kind of turned out. That's kind of the pacing Jeffrey Eugenides is on though lately. So that's you know. true, but he is uh, Jeffrey Eugenides. Oh, well, true. <laughs> However, I mean, let's talk about, cause right before we got started, folks, I was commenting Michael on his great radio voice. And he said that that was almost a path that he went on before he got into writing. I guess, talk to us about how you got into writing and how yeah. you diverged from that voice work. Yeah. I think, um, I think toward the end of college, I was just starting to, uh, realize that I was enjoying writing more than anything else I was doing at that time. I was taking a lot of English classes and suddenly I was making, you know, just doing a lot of papers, theses, theses, theses. Uh, theses mm -hmm. Okay. Never uh, easy to say. Yeah. I, it, it sounded weird just when I was saying It'll it. It always sound weird. It will. And, uh, so, uh, yeah. So I just started to, to really just, feel like, oh, you know, I think I want to do this. And, and even still, even at that point, I was years away from writing fiction and it all came about in sort of a, a weird kind of a quiet way. I, I had been working in advertising for a number of years and just started to feel like, okay, I, you know, I think I want to write some stories. And I was reading a lot of Raymond Carver at the time and various other writers that I was just sort of, I was fascinated by them. And I think uh, Raymond Carver kind of tricked me into thinking that I could write fiction because of the, the <laughs> very uh, uh, sort of, you know, that deceptively simple 
kind of style of his. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think I sort of felt like, I think I can do this, you know. And then the more I read Raymond Carver, the more I realized those stories, you know, had a, a, a real sort of underpinning of all kinds of meaning and and uh, sort of emotion and feeling to them. Vonnegut did the same thing to me. He made it look easy. Yeah, I think and so. And then it wasn't. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, that's the way that's the way it works too. Yes, it, that's exactly <laughs> the way it was. And and in my case, I think I wound up writing a lot of very uh, let's see, Carver esque, Carverian uh, mm -hmm, sort mm -hmm. of uh, stories before I wrote something that felt like uh, that me. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and you do. Ha I feel like you have a a signature now. Um, you know. And, uh, you know, a lot of your books often are dealing with uh, maybe lost keepsakes or the past or, you know, even also processing grief. You have a lot going on in your in your books. I tend to. Yeah, I, I, it took me a while to realize that I do tend to cram a lot of things into into <laughs> my books and um, which, uh, you know, I, I think. It was one of those things that uh, that probably ties into a lot of the things I write about too. Uh, you know, my first book was uh, you know secondhand, and that uh, dealt a lot with collectors and uh, bring I don't know, uh, yeah, who almost uh, kind of hoard things, but not really. There's no hoarders <laughs> in them. Uh, they see treasures. Yes, they seek treasures, and uh, you know, and so sometimes I think I write in that same way, in that I gather a lot of things together and hope that I can sort of uh, put together some sort of meaning, some way to tie them all in together. And You're uh, an arranger. I think so, yeah, yeah. And, and very much so uh, that uh, sometimes I think I will, uh, once I discover the world that I want to uh, inhabit, I think part of the joy of writing for me is kind of furnishing that world in a mm -hmm. way, you know, not just with stuff, but uh, but just I don't know who's going to be in it, what's going to happen, uh, and and you know what's going to surround everyone and what's not going to surround them too, because I, I think that's that's important too. What's I don't know what's not in a book. What's uh, I don't know if that makes an enormous amount of sense, <laughs> but but I, I I've always liked kind of examining the. Boy, this is this is sounding like pretentious literary chatter here. We're here for it. We're Michael. here for it. Okay, right. I'm gonna let loose. No, I think it's always interesting to kind of examine the the space around characters or the world that they inhabit. Yeah. And, and you know, so I I hope that happens. I don't know. It might just be uh, me just <laughs> imagining these things, but sure. I, I try to. It's they every book is all uh, they've all felt kind of different, but I think they hopefully all have a kind of, I think you're right. I think there are similar themes and ideas going on in all of them. Yes. Um, a theme and it's not only because you have a book with the word lost in it, lost Tiki palaces, but I think there is an idea of sort of, um, grappling with what can be lost. Um, you know, I was thinking about secondhand and, you know, what is a secondhand store but filled with these items that lost their owners? Um, and I also feel like I just saw, like, in a secondhand store, there could be a, a hi-fi stereo or a record player. And if those are lost from their owners, they're not special anymore until they have an owner. They're just furniture. Um, yeah. And then in you have Beautiful Music, which came out about two years ago. Right. That is in the past, and you're you're talking about you know, sort of the aftermath of the riots in Detroit. And, you know, you can even think about things that were lost in, in that, in that instance in history. And then the leisure seeker, uh, the losing of memory, Alzheimer's going on. Right. And, and they travel a road that's sort of, you know, forgotten and abandoned and crumbling. Yeah. And, uh, that, that's all part of a lost America too. So I almost thought in a way you're writing ghost stories in a way. That's an interesting thought. Yeah. I, I mean, I do tend to write a lot about, uh, I guess, forgotten things. And uh, even if you want to be the way some people have, have mentioned that, uh, there's always a lot of like 
like obsolete technology <laughs> in my books. <laughs> and I do have a weakness for that kind of stuff. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and lately, um, I think writing about the past has, has allowed me to maybe indulge some of that. And that was certainly the case in, in beautiful music to, uh, there were a lot of mornings, uh, writing where I was just kind of, you know, I would spend the whole morning just kind of crafting paragraphs, uh, over like someone waxing poetic over the, the sound of a phonograph needle dropping onto a vinyl record. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, those felt sort of, you know, at the time I thought, am I just indulging myself by, by doing this and, uh, writing about what I, I don't know what I thought was the beauty of of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just that, that idea that the, that sort of hiss and pop that happens when, when the needle drops on, on a vinyl record or the, the feeling of, uh, of an album cover in your hands where it kind of digs into the, the pads of your, your hands. Right. And uh, that kind of stuff fascinates me. And, um, and it is also writing about, yeah, it's, it is definitely writing about what is lost when, when we don't use those things anymore, where we don't uh, use that technology or talk about those things anymore, they're gone. And uh, I, I don't know. I think part of writing is uh, about, uh, you know, capturing a particular time, capturing a particular, you know, uh, era or moment in time. And yeah. Yeah. And it's also sort of asking, is there something I can return to reliably for healing or to process emotions? Cause what resonated with me about beautiful music is I often ask myself, I'm feeling pretty bad right now. I have a lot going on and there's a lot that's happened to me. I'm stressed. Can a piece of music make me feel better right now? And that book kind of explores that because the absolutely. characters are going through a lot, but he can put those headphones on. Yeah, absolutely. That is uh, music for Danny is uh, uh, beautiful music. Uh, music is what saves him mm-hmm. really. And it, it, it winds up being not just a sort of, of thing that soothes him, but it does, but it also winds up, uh, I think, giving him a certain, uh, helping him find his strength. And even his uh, his his purpose, yeah. And yeah. so music winds up being everything to him, and and consequently everything in the book is kind of filtered through music, including his grief. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's it was an interesting thing to 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 write about that and the power of music. And some critics pointed out that. Uh, you know, a lot of times, I mean, it is in, in many ways a kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it's a coming of age story, no doubt about it. The early and, 70s of the teenager. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, yes, years after the 67 rebellion and everything is changing in, in Detroit. And for this young man, everything in his world is changing. His neighborhood, his school, uh, his home life implodes and uh and some critics have mentioned that, uh, you know, and a lot of times in those kinds of stories, there'll be a, a sort of romantic peg or whatever, you know, somebody falls in love with someone. And there's nothing like that in beautiful music. And I can't say that it ever even crossed my mind because he's, uh, you know, he's a, a, a very quiet, loner, nerdy kind of kid. And uh, meeting a girl isn't even on the table for him. Right. That, that's right. not, but the love he finds is music. That's yeah. that's the rom- that's his romance in in the book is yeah. is the music. And uh, so uh, that all made sense to me when somebody wrote that about the book. And it's like, well, of course, there's no that kind of there's not that kind of romance, right? Plus, uh, timeline wise, it's too early to make a mixtape for whoever he has a crush right. on. So he can. So, um, but unless it's an eight track. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about these themes you like to explore. Uh, take us back fifteen years or more. You know, before Michigan Notable, before Kresge. You know, were you know, bef- like when you realize that Secondhand is going to be your first big book. You know, were you? Did you realize these these themes and these ideas and these things were coming into your head about what you really wanted to write about? And if not, were you always sure you wanted to keep your stories local? Um, you know, I don't think I did realize it at the time of second hand. I had already, in a lot of ways, it was my second novel. I had written 
a first novel, which is still unpublished and, and will probably continue to be unpublished. But, um, but I think by that time I was already writing about some of those themes and, but it wasn't, I didn't set out that that would be my, my particular, uh, whatever milieu or, uh, you know, my the, these are my light motifs. You're very interested like in that. characters, though. Yes, absolutely. You know? I, 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 I think I probably write very character-driven fiction. I've got a tough question for you. Oh, geez. So uh, author Josh Malloman was here on the show recently, and he was talking about, because he got to read your book first before anybody, book, he got yes. a preview, and he said that he was just enjoying kind of living in the world that you were making in your book for not as direct quote, but he just liked being there with those people. And that's a, that's an art form unto itself is keeping your, your reader enticed throughout the whole 320 pages um, and, and making them want to return to the world you're establishing. Even if it is, this is a real world in this book, narcissism of small things, it's 2009 and it's Ferndale, but he just was really taken with the characters you had crafted and the settings you were having them in. And that's that's got to be the hardest thing. Plot is one thing, but world building is another. Character yeah. building. Yeah, I, I do think that that does maybe tie in a little bit to uh, what I was talking about is is uh, deciding on your world and then furnishing it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, in in this book too, I think a lot of that that stuff is. It's probably determined by, uh, to a certain extent, by just what obsesses me. And uh, a friend of mine said that once. He said, uh, when you write a novel, you find out what your obsessions are. Uh. And I think that's absolutely true that, uh, you know, I, I think if you're going to write about something for 300, 400 pages, there's got to be something there that that grabs you, too, and that resonates with you. And... Uh, the the new book was was kind of different just because I did I don't know I did put in a lot of <laughs> what seemingly disparate elements of it I mean there is uh, you know sort of uh, there's tiki in it there is urban exploration which uh, if you're not from Detroit and you don't know what that is it about probably about 10 years ago during the uh the time that the book takes place which it takes place in 2009 detroit there were a lot of people detroit had probably more abandoned buildings than pretty much anywhere in america and so there were a lot of people that were basically breaking into them not necessarily to do damage although those there were other people doing that um but to just take photographs and kind of explore you know again these these sort of lost places there's a character who is leading the main character into one building i think it's the united artists theater mm -hmm. and he just forces the protagonist to stop and say he pauses and he says that's history he just he's meditating on it in the mm -hmm. book and i love that moment yeah yeah i uh well when i was uh, i was talking to some people that that did uh urban exploration uh, when I was researching the book and, and somebody had said something to that effect. And I, and I really loved that because it's, it's important. To, I think it's important to just sometimes just stop and listen to anything that you're, you're doing, whether you're walking down the street or wherever, but when you walk into a, I don't know, uh, like an abandoned space or a, a, a place that's filled with a, a kind of sickness really that some of those abandoned buildings I, I feel like are and I think that one character does say something to that effect that uh, you know these buildings are, are kind of sick and dying and uh, so I, I, I really thought that was an interesting thing to to explore and uh, and also the fact that people who were doing this saw a, a kind of twisted beauty to it all too and and that fascinated me too and again as a person who appreciates you know whatever things that have been lost or abandoned or broken or imperfect you know that fascinated me and i think that um just going off into a different direction too and as you talk to more authors and artists from around here i think you'll find some of that same thing that that I would actually call a kind of Detroit aesthetic. Yeah. Where that uh, people who, 
you know, if you talk to, to Glenn Barr, say, uh, and, uh, you know, really well-known artist from Ferndale <laughs> also mm-hmm. lives in Ferndale and he, he's made a lot of paintings of, you know, sort of abandoned buildings and broken things. And I mean, among many other things, and he's another guy I can see, uh, who was, who was sort of led by his obsessions as well. Yeah. And, uh, but, but I, I really think that, um, I think people who grew up here, uh, those sort of things become part of you and you grow up in this, in many ways, uh, less so these days, somewhat less so, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a a place that was considered a a broken city, really. And I think it affects the things you make Mm -hmm. and whether it's writing or painting or sculpture I think uh, I think Detroit, uh, you know, that happens a lot. I'm thinking also of like I believe it's Mike Kelly who made a lot of art out of old. Like he would find uh, go to thrift stores and find all these old stuffed animals and things and make something massive out of them. And uh, you know, so I, I really think those things come of the, you know, of course, the Heidelberg Project. Mm-hmm. And uh, things like that, uh, that winds up becoming part of, uh, you know, the aesthetic of a city. And and so the people who make things here, I think that becomes part of them. Yeah. And it affects what they make. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking around it, and I didn't want to put words in your mouth, but if you were asked to describe this new book for readers, obviously there's a, there's a couple at the center of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm still finding my way into, you know, you have to, when you, uh, have a no, new book out, you have to have no the spoilers. elevator, you yeah. have to have the elevators a speech, but yeah, you can't go around having spoilers, <laughs> but I think it, in a lot of ways it is a sort of love story, but it's kind of not really, it's a story about a couple. Uh, I, I would call them probably Gen X. They're approaching 40, and uh, both of them are, are kind of creative types. Uh, but uh, as they approach 40, I think, you know, they're both finding that things didn't turn out quite what they, in the way they had figured. Uh, him, he's a kind of a failed uh, writer. And, uh, and she's a, a really successful advertising person, an art director. And uh, they wind up, you know, as they approach middle age, I think they discover that, uh, you know, they're not so sure they, they, they work together anymore in their way. And, and the book is kind of them working it out and, uh, for good or bad. But in the meantime, they're surrounded by a lot of friends and, and basically, I guess what you could call their, uh, peer group, their mm-hmm. tribe, their whatever. Mm-hmm. And most of them are creative types too. So it's very much about, and it takes place right here in Ferndale, That's right. which is a place filled with creative types. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so it was interesting to just, uh, kind of name names and it's like, let's just have this be in Ferndale. That's right. And, uh, and it's a place where that's always, you know, I mean, at least for the past probably 20, 25 years, it's been inhabited by lots of musicians and writers and public radio types oh, yeah. and artists of, uh, of many different stripes. And uh, so, so it was interesting to do that. So in a lot of ways, it's a very chatty book. And, uh, and, and I think maybe even a little tribute to, to having, to finding the family where you, uh, you know, where you find it. Yeah, and, yeah. and in, in some ways it's, it's very much about that. Uh, you know, and it's also a very chatty book too. And, and you know, something I, 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 in some ways I had to go to a book festival not that long ago and you have to do these sort of speed dating things where you, you go to a table of booksellers and, uh, you have to pitch your book to them oh, basically. No. <laughs> and then, then you go from table to table to table. So this is the glamorous world of letters that, wow. that, uh, and so sometimes you'll do, I've done, I think as many as like 12 tables in one afternoon, you only get five minutes. You're with another writer. Oh gosh. And I was, uh, I was talking about this book because it's coming out next May. And part of me was saying, I'm going to try and go for that, that sort of Hollywood kind of uh, a description where you kind of compare it to something else. And what I kind of came up with, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I said, it's a little because it is about this couple, but it's also about this group of people. 
Uh, you know, it's a little like, uh, you know, maybe a sort of reality bites, only now everybody's middle-aged and tired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's actually close. It really kind of is. Because I can, uh, they, they sort of uh, create around each other and ab- about each other too. So Yeah. I, I also thought about it as what if, you know, the characters weren't having uh, independent individual identity crisis crises and they were having an identity crises as a couple and what would that look like that's a really um, that i'm gonna steal that that's please a do. great that's a great way to it's like a a couple's identity crisis yeah really in a, in a lot of ways i want to write that down now so i don't forget well we will we will <laughs> let's talk more about also that that the fun aspect of in, getting able to include your creative peers who are actually real artists here in these, you know, this is a fiction book with characters made is. up, but uh, artists like uh, performance artist Satori Circus is right. is name checked, as well as the High Strung, which features Josh yes. Mallerman, of course. So that must have been fun. It was fun, actually, and that's another thing about sort of furnishing that world. And I thought, well, why why would I make up uh, 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 other artists when I can just, uh, you know, I'm just gonna, uh, you know mention them by name and uh uh so so just so everyone knows no one gets trashed and uh (laughs) that uh, i strung right uh, no no it's not like that at all you do imply that they play loud music though i do that is implied that is implied yes his ears are buzzing sorry yes and uh but uh other than that it's uh no indictment of, of no. any other and in a lot of ways i mean some of the characters in the book are are like people that i i know mm-hmm. which uh we'll see how that works out right right <laughs> but that's another great thing is that you've been detroit all your life so you've been able to see this whole creative community evolve and change and people come into your life it's not like you went off to la or new york you've been here man that's so you do have a community. Yeah, I I, I, I think I do, uh, and it's it's nice. And it, and it took me a long time as a writer to realize, I think uh, during that period when I was reading Raymond Carver or whatever, uh, I, I think when things when when my writing really started to feel like my writing was when I started writing about where I was from mm-hmm. and this place and the people from here. And, and that was a really important lesson for me when I realized, oh, this is an advantage. This is a kind of gift that I, you know, and I mean, I'm not saying it always seems, it always feels that way. Um, you know, I'm sure my work gets ignored sometimes because it's like, what? It takes place in Detroit, nah. you know, but um, it, it really became important for me to, uh, to, to, set my books here Mm -hmm. and to have them be about here. And sometimes people say, have you ever thought of, uh, you know, you would set this somewhere else. And, and I'm not so sure I could set any of my books anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, the closest I probably came to it was the leisure seeker, but even still they were from Detroit and they, and even though most of the book does not take place in Detroit, Detroit is always there. Mm -hmm. It's a presence in their minds, in their lives uh, in it's a, an elderly couple going on a, a, a last vacation together down Route 66 to Disneyland, and they're both longtime, lifetime Detroiters. And uh, you know, as they as they travel, they're kind of trying to remember their lives. And especially one of the characters has Alzheimer's, so the other one is constantly trying to remember this. Remember, don't you remember? And so slides are shown more obsolete technology Mm -hmm. and um so it it, you know but detroit is definitely a presence there and um in beautiful music too i could not have the more the deeper i got into that book the more i realized that it was about uh so much about those years after after you know the summer of 1967 and all the unrest and all and everything that was in the air in Detroit then. And and even though there was all this incredible music in the air and these iconic radio stations, you know, after after what happened, after the rebellion, I mean, there was also all this hate and rage and fear and anger in the air along with all the great music. And, the, and for me, that was when the book kind of came together. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it was when I realized, oh, yeah, it's got to be about that, too. And it just dawned on me. I could have asked Josh this question, uh, but I'll ask you. <laughs> you're you're not. I'll, I'll text Josh while you ask. You me. know, <laughs> uh, I don't think that you um, hold back on really putting your characters through things, really through some really. I mean, with Josh, it's horror. He's scaring all of his characters. But, you know, you're putting them through some real world stuff, it, not even just processing grief, but just emotional things they might not even be able to compute. You know, as a writer, that's got to be pretty intense for you. Um, yeah, it is. And I, I, it's strange because I don't necessarily set out to do that, but it, it's just the way things happen. And I think with, uh, with beautiful music, I, at a certain point, I realized, oh, this, this big kind of sad thing has to happen. And it makes which, it more than just coming of age. It makes it more. Yeah, I, 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 I hope, I hope so, you know, and, uh, not that I don't love coming of age tales because no, I do. Sure. I'm a, uh, I'm a big one on the Bildungs Roman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. More literary talk. Sure. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, and let's see, I said milieu, Bildungs Roman. <laughs> the world of letters. The world of letters. <laughs> and I think I need to fit in Romana clay. Oh, yeah. And Fine. then and then it'll be, I, I think I will hit the pretentious <laughs> uh, trifecta or <laughs> there. And now that you're here on a, on a library podcast, can you just talk about libraries? Have you any memories of them? Have they played a role in your development? Oh, God, yes. Um, I, when I was growing up, and I mean, I grew up in the same neighborhood right. that beautiful music was set in. That's another story there, too. Mm-hmm. It's like, do I make up a fi- like a different Detroit neighborhood or a, di- a fictional high school? And I thought, no, why would I do that? No, I'm going to, it's going to take place in the neighborhood I grew up in. And uh, and all through Detroit, again, if you're not from Detroit, uh, you would not know that Detroit is filled with old bank buildings that, uh, you know, that probably were all, you know, many of them were like Detroit Bank and Savings or something like that, uh, and various other Detroit banks. And uh, I'm sure it had something to do with perhaps the Depression, but also perhaps, uh, you know, there, there was probably a lot of banks when Detroit was fat and sassy and and uh, my old uh, my old local library was uh, was an old bank. Oh, and that's awesome! So it was it had all that that kind of maje- uh, majesty that you want when you kind of walk into a library. You want to feel some of that. It's like a, like an old movie theater or something. When they back when they used to build things, so you felt something when you walked in. You got that sense of importance. You felt like safe there. You felt. Uh, you know, okay, something important happens here, and that definitely had that. And a lot of the old, uh, uh, the the old like Carnegie libraries have that, and uh, just uh, you know when all those there was that big spate of those those being built. Anyways, my library had that. You walk in, and the, you know these tall ceilings, and so it always felt like a really special, important place to me. And that was also where I used to go, and uh, they had records. They had oh, mine. Awesome. Mine had records, so it was it was thrilling for me to go. And that's really how. And I think that actually even affected beautiful music too, because Danny talks about a lot of '60s rock, which in theory would be before his time. But if you were a rock and roll kid in the '70s, you were just you know you were okay. Yes, tell me more about cream or tell me about you know whoever else the jefferson airplane and in my case that was uh that was the album i took out from my one of the albums i took out from my library was surrealistic pillow and it was pretty old album even then but uh i remember it just blowing my little teenage mind you Mm -hmm. know and so that was that was a a a really special thing for me and and to go there and I, i was always taking out books and and for me too it was uh kind of a restful place too, because if you were sort of, uh, you know, I think now there's a lot more permission for, uh, uh, young people to be indoor kids, yes. you know, and, uh, if you're an indoor kid in the seventies, uh, you know, a library was a great place to go in the summer. You know, mm-hmm. it was, it was quiet. It was, you know, maybe it was a little cooler than your home, Maybe it wasn't. I don't. I don't remember if my library was air conditioned, but it was uh, a, a place you could go and just hang out and 
considering all the stuff you could access once you're inside too. Right. And so it was like an uh, arcade for the mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and so, uh, so it continues to be in, in just with, uh, beautiful music again, uh, I wound up going to the Burton collection to do research, uh, you know, just to go through microfiche, which, which is hilarious that there is still microfiche. I was going to say, it's is the there still weirdest, microfiche? It's just the weirdest contraption of, it really is the eight track tape of the library world. You know, uh, <laughs> someone who didn't know what microfiche was asked me to describe what it is or define it. And I could not, but. I know that it retains newspapers. Yes, it retains. It's almost like a uh, like a hand, uh, uh, gosh, a, a reel with with film on it that mm -hmm. you crank yourself that shows old newspapers, mm -hmm. and and uh, much of it is being digitized now. Right, but it, that's right. a massive job for most libraries, and and they're, I know many of them. You know, that's a slow job, uh, but it will be great. But it's they're literally aren't they photographs of newspapers? Yeah, and and so but they're invaluable for writers, yeah. and so I did that just for the seventies, just to get a sense of uh, you know even the pop culture, what mm -hmm. was going on news wise, the stories that were happening as far as uh, you know just uh, post sixty seven and uh, just all the things that were going on the election of Coleman, Coleman Young mm -hmm. and, and also just the pop culture stuff because the ads are there too. Yeah. And that's what's amazing. Right. Yeah. And that's much, let's also remind listeners going to that Burton collection for research, much better than Googling. Oh, so much better. <laughs> and, and again, you get that sense of like, okay, this is history here. Yeah. You feel history in that place. So like we were talking about before with the book. I, I mean, and to go there and to look through the uh, the old directories and uh, it's just and I mean for me um, like just beautiful music in a lot of ways was a way to kind of uh, you know kind of do detective work on mm -hmm. my own past too and to to figure out okay you know and I think you can write a book for many different reasons. And one of the reasons I think I wrote it was to uh, a chance to do some detective work on my home, my own life, my past to see why and how I became the adult I became. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the detective work definitely was going to the Burton collection and looking through the old city directories, the like the Polk directories, I think, and, and uh, library shout out. Polk oh, directors. yes. And um uh, so, you know, so that was amazing. And then to like, just rediscover those things. And when you're trying to write, I guess, uh, a novel that takes place in a, a very particular point in time, you know, that kind of stuff, I, I, you know, you don't necessarily, at least I don't write everything down, but you know, you find yourself soaking things up. And yeah. so, and so going through that crazy microfiche was invaluable for that. And, um, so it, it was uh, it was really helpful and uh, yeah I mean, right. just all kinds of uh, you know just libraries uh, you know they're 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 unlike anything else and I think they're becoming an even more kind of special and even more needed kind of place these days because we all feel like we can gather all this stuff yeah via Google or whatever but. That's, uh, you know, and I use a, that stuff a lot when I'm writing just for quick information. But if you want something deeper and if you want to you want to go deeper, you really I think you do need to go to a place like a library. The authoritative source mm -hmm. of information. Right. Um, Mike, thanks for being here today. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I have to say as someone who populates their book with outdated uh, technology, as you say, or uh I think outdated is just a matter of perception because we can put a pin on this by saying a lot of people think the library is outdated and boy, is it not? Yeah. Oh matter no. Matter of perception. It's all in who treasures it. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's very much, yeah. Well, you tied that back to, uh, uh, you know, to, I think my first book too, which is like, uh, you know, I think we put the value on these things. We decide what the value of things are just because somebody, something is, is different from uh, whatever we use now, our smartphones or our computers, whatever. 
uh, they are not of great value. And we assign the value, and libraries have an infinite amount of value. On that note, I have to cue the music. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Um, Michael Zadorian's new book is called The Narcissism of Small Differences, and it's going to be coming out in a few months in May on Akashic, Akashic. Uh, publishing Akashic. house Akashic. No. <laughs> and uh, maybe take me with you for your next uh, book festival where you need elevator pitches I'm here for you All just, right. just call me up I can do that we want to thank you for listening to another episode of A Little Too Quiet the Ferndale Library podcast it's brought to you by the friends of the Ferndale Library you can become a member if you visit ferndalefriends.org shout out to John Duffy the musician who gave us the theme music for this And uh, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. If you could, please give us a rating on iTunes. It'll help us find more listeners. Thanks again to Michael Zadorian for being here. Kelly Bennett is the producer, and I'm Jeff Milo. Thanks for listening, and tune in. There I am going with tune in again. Tune in to this podcast and stream it. Thanks for listening.